Dr. Yoel Lubel. He's an associate professor at the Center of Tropical Medicine and Global Health at the University of Oxford and uh, is head of economics and implementation research at the mild, mild of Oxford Topical Medicine Research Unit uh, in Bangkok. And so uh, it's uh, now my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor uh, Blaise Janton. He's a professor of tropical and travel medicine at the Faculty of Biology and Medicine in Lausanne. And he spent uh, more 13 years in developing countries working mainly on malaria and no malaria fevers. Thank you. And just, if you weren't here yesterday, I'll just introduce my co-chair as well, Dr. Florence Pradell. So she heads up the Gabriel Network and we'll be hearing all about that in the second half of the session. Bonjour à tous. Uh, merci pour l'invitation de la Fondation Merieux. I will continue in uh, English. Uh, I thank you everybody for the invitation and uh, I'm very happy to be back in Annecy. Unfortunately, it's the winter because uh, I like to swim at the end of the session or even in the middle of the session. And that's where you actually do the best collaboration that you can have. This is what happened once. So, our uh, I have been asked to speak about epidemiology of febrile illness beyond malaria. Uh, I started to think of it, and uh, fortunately, David maybe has uh, set the scene yesterday, but it's really very difficult to summarize or to look at the uh, general tendencies, etc. So I decided to... Uh, focus on the challenges of etiology of fever studies, also because it's a bit the theme of uh, the conference. So when we think about epidemiology, we have to think about the importance of the problem and the incidence of febrile episode. Uh, I, I will focus more in Africa, like David maybe, because it's where I, I, I spend, uh, we spend the, the last uh, years. And uh, this is just an example of the incidence of fever. You know that it's very different if you uh, look at what happens in the health facility or in the community, the type of surveillance that you do, the type of activity, intensity that you do. But I think summarizing also all the data from, uh, for example, RTSS, malaria vaccine trial, etc., where incidence was well estimated, we can say that probably a child in Africa has between uh, three and five or six episodes per year, and an adult about uh, 1.5 to 2. This is really very rough, but uh, you see a bit the size of the problem. Now, when you look at the uh, type of uh, fever that you can detect, uh, what you can detect in the hospital, for one case in the hospital, you have about 10 cases that will present in outpatient clinic about 100 in primary care health facilities and about 400 in the community. So that depends very much where you work because the severity of the disease is very different. If you are here, probably your child has a more severe disease than if you are here. And this is, has been clearly shown in a lot of different studies. So basically in hospitals you have more bacterial infections, severe disease, than in the community where you have more mild and more viral diseases. This is a generalization. But uh, so when you are looking at etiology of fevers, then the conventional method of blood culture, for example, we know that if you do blood culture in fever, ch in febrile children in the community, you get about one percent or less. Uh, children that where you will find a bacteria in the blood. If you do in primary care, it's about one to two. And if you go in outpatient, two to four, and probably five to 10% in uh, the hospital. So again, 
where you do your study is very important because that will uh, uh, determine the, the detection level that you will have for your pathogens. So my presentation will go a bit through all of these, uh, not in detail as you can imagine, but uh, these are really the challenges when I try to summarize and comparing the etiology of fever studies, really because you have different age profile, you have different inclusion criteria. Seasonality is important, even year to year variation. Some studies look at one disease, some others look at one syndrome, some look at all fevers. The patient population, the characteristic, uh, HIV, for example, in which places you do your studies, primary care, emergency wards, etc., that will determine the complication. The clinical workup, are, are you a microbiologist that look at uh, pathogens only, or are you a clinician that you get clinician? Are you both, looking at both? So that's very different uh, result will be uh, obtain. Intensity of investigation, the more you do, the more you have, and uh, rural versus urban, and the malaria and the mycity. So we'll go through a bit. So I, I just give you examples. So don't, don't be offended for those who did a lot of these studies, because I cannot go through all the studies, and I, I, I know the best, the one that we did, so you will have more of that. But certainly a lot of people here in the room have done a lot of these, and especially also in Asia, but I think you will uh, hear a, a bit more of with, with the give, um, next uh, presentation. So age profile. I took one of the, la the first one of Crump in northern Tanzania. Uh, these are a bit uh, older uh, terminology. So for me, bloodstream infection is an infection in the blood. So basically for me, dengue is also bloodstream infection, but maybe you, 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 we, we can uh, discuss of that. So at that time, bloodstream infection meant really blood culture positive, malaria parasite, and fungi. And you see that. Basically, the, there are a lot of differences if you are an adult or a child. For example, malaria in adults, 7%, 27% here in infants. Uh, bloodstream infection, 27% in adults, but uh, much less in, uh, in uh, children. So depending on your study population, you will have different results. Now, that's what we had in in uh, Tanzania also, I, I, I take the example of Tanzania with the different studies because then you can compare a bit. So Kilombero is not the same as Moshi, but still. So just what I wanted to highlight here, for example, typhoid fever, you see very uh, few in, in the very young children and then it increases. Malaria, acute respiratory infection, it's the contrary, etc. So even within the children, you have differences. This is, again, in Kilombero, another study uh, uh, more recently published that looked at uh, the different pathogens by PCR only, according to age. And what I wanted to highlight here is that, you know, some of these diseases where we discussed yesterday, Leptospira is uh, frequent, and that was in northern Tanzania, for example, Rickettsia also. Here in this population, only by PCR, and we know that PCR is not as good as uh, other methodology for, for uh, bacteria, for example. You can see that there is none in the young children a bit more after, and you only find them in adults. So we have to be careful when we say, oh, there is Leptospira in, in Tanzania, because uh, in our studies we found uh, very few. So what about inclusion criteria? Uh, this is a, a, a study that was done in 2015 in Dar es Salaam with the same methodology that uh, we did uh, with the children. So it's uh, Valérie Dacremont and Noemi Boya that did this study. And you can see that the same with children, we took all fevers because we want to have a kind of uh, overall picture. You can see that if you take only the infection without focus, basically you are... Uh, left with about one-third of all fevers. If you get rid of those who have cough or, or um, respiratory uh, symptoms, it's even more. So it's quite important to, to know that because then after you have this pie chart where you can have 
uh, very biased estimate that, re that really the real burden of uh, the fevers. And I will go a bit more. If you take this respiratory infection, that's what we found in this uh, population. And uh, you see that if you go to look for respiratory pathogen, then you, you find a lot, and that is part uh, of the fever. You can see here, we just took the radiological pneumonia as an example here, and that's what you get in nasopharyngeal um, uh, swabs uh, by, by PCR. You see there is a lot of streptococcus pneumonia. This is nothing uh, new. There is a bit of uh, hemophilus influenzae, staph aureus, and you have uh, viruses also. So uh, you have a, a better picture if you do them all. Now I just wanted to highlight, because when you look at uh, the, the numbers, people say, oh, we had 21% of rickettsiosis. This is what we got actually in, in the, you see, this is the infection without focus. This is the overall picture. You can see we will discuss this dengue, 53% here. These are the viruses that we found. So if you go by numbers, this was 252 out of 519 adults. So when you say, oh, we had 10% of bacterial infection, this is 25 out of these numbers. Again, if you say, oh, we have 4% of leptospirosis, actually we have one case. And the same for rickettsiosis. We have five cases, which is 1% of all of these. So just to highlight that it is difficult to look at percentages. And the uh, same, for example, for West Nile, you know, we say, oh, West Nile, yes, 13%. No, we had only four, which is, again, 1% of the total. So just keep this in mind when you think of it. Seasonality, <laughs> again, I take this example. You see here, this was in Dar es Salaam. Usually there is not much dengue in Africa. But here you can see that what happened during this uh, study, which uh, messed up a bit the study, we can say that actually there was no dengue, which is expected in Dar es Salaam, and suddenly you can see that it's in red, that de we had a dengue epidemic. Fortunately, we were doing the studies because they said this is a malaria epidemic, but actually it was a dengue one, and you see influenza is the same. So it's very important to know, to have at least, we know that one year, one year or even probably a bit more. Because when, once you say these are the bacterial infection and these are the viral infection, if you, if you see before the dengue outbreak, you see this were all, all the bacterial infection in these adults. But during the dengue outbreak, you have the proportion of the bacterial infection is much less. So be always aware of what is happening in the community. This was the same in a recently study, published study in uh, Southeast Asia where you see that uh, Scroop typhus, again, it's very seasonal with the rains, and uh, same with the dengue. So we have to be careful when we do that. This is a, a, a summary studies that were recently published in an issue where you had all a summary of this etiology of fever studies. This is in Latin America, and you can say, see these are all the studies with the dates. And this is what you, you get during these different studies. And you can see here, for example, if you do this in Mato Grosso, because it's also a question of location, but then uh, a lot of no etiology. And when you do this in 2015, 16, then you have Zika, and then you have no more Zika, etc. So the year-to-year -year variation is very important when you do the study. You cannot do anything against that, but uh, I think that you have to be aware. Patient population. Uh, the characteristic here, again, I'm sorry with this uh, study, but you, maybe you don't know it because it's not yet published, so maybe it's, a, it's an opportunity. But what we, we had 37% of uh, HIV-positive uh, adults, so it's very important to always test for HIV. We know that, but it's not uh, always done. But what I want to highlight here, that actually in those who are negative, the probability of having a bacterial infection is much less, you see, about 70% uh, have a viral infection, although if uh, they, have, uh, a, they are HIV positive, it's about uh, uh, exactly the reverse. So it's important to know what is the HIV uh, uh, prevalence in, in the study that you do. Now this was shown by uh, David yesterday, 
it's also different what you find if you have a severe child or if you have the whole spectrum. This is the whole spectrum of what we got, but as was uh, highlighted, David, yesterday, is that if you have severe disease, you can see that basically you have much more malaria, you have double of the typhoid, you have double of the rhydrogical pneumonia, you have much less uh, upper respiratory tract infection. So it depends really the patient uh, characteristic and the severity. What about the clinical workup? Uh, we, we call that the botanic garden if you do uh, only uh, microbiology versus uh, infectious disease. This is again the example of uh, what we, we did in, in, in Tanzania. This is the botanic garden. This is basically what we found in terms of viruses, in the nasopharyngeal swabs, etc., in the blood, etc. These are the these are the viruses in blue, these are the bacteria, and these are those who had both. So if you look only at pathogens, you all know here in the room, I don't need to do that. But then the difficulty is to go for the disease. So you include your clinical, uh, the symptoms and the sign, and you try to infer what is the uh, cause of uh, the fever. This is very difficult, and there are always arbitrary decisions when you do that, but I think it's important when you think of morbidity, and you will hear that after with Valerie talk. W one study done in Zanzibar children, you see, uh, there are very few studies that had kind of controls. Controls mean healthy children but who is healthy in Zanzibar? And I think this is a good example. When you see rhinoviruses, they are more in the controls, in green, than in the patients. Maybe all these children had running nose, uh, but certainly the cause of fever is, is very clear with influenza. In all studies, that is very clear. I mean, influenza is linked to disease, even if we, ha we can have asymptomatic influenza. But I think this helps also, but the choice of the controls is complicated and probably you need healthy control, but you may also need some other patients that have a clear other disease, like typhoid or malaria, to have kind of controls. And maybe you will hear from Heidi what, what, what they uh, decided in the fever study. Now, intensity of investigation, sensitivity of the test, case definition, these are all very important things uh, uh, when you uh, interpret the findings. You see uh, here, these are, again, this bloodstream infection versus the serological methods because uh, uh, Crump used the serological methods. And you see that you can have different uh, numbers. This is all in adults. You see here, 3% had leptospira versus 10% here, 1% versus 10%. This was done in different uh, time. This is done in different location, but it is still done in adults in Tanzania. So you may say, okay, let's do serology, for example. We think that the best option is probably to, to have composite diagnosis. You all know that, but uh, I think you have to have either this and this or either this or this. And uh, it's important for the clinical symptoms and also for the, uh, for the microbiology. We also know that serology may just be uh, activated when you have another disease. So there are the specificity of serology might be difficult to interpret. So it, it is always difficult to, to, to have a, uh, an absolute picture. What about malaria endemicity? This is a recently study also that is interesting because this is the probability of detecting pathogens in these different uh, uh, syndromes according to parasite density. And you see that the studies that exclude malaria from their uh, um, patient population, then you exclude a number of children that have other infections. And I think it's important to include also the uh, malaria cases, basically it's important not to exclude some patient, except if you are very short in terms of uh, money, and we know that this may be the problem. Now what about burden of disease? How these studies relate, reflect burden of disease? Crump again uh, did a, 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 a paper on that, 
and the problem stays a bit uh, the same. You see, I took actually the uh, study done in Laos <coughs> by Paul Newton and, and his team. So I, I looked at Laos in the same age range and in the same period to see what, what we got from that. This is basically, you know, this, uh, these are the chronic diseases, these are the injuries, trauma, etc., and these are more uh, towards uh, uh, infections. And if you go a bit more in detail, you can see that is the burden. This was the DALI. It was not mortality. This is a DALI, uh, which is uh, somewhat uh, a bit different when you have an acute febrile illness because the DALI is, is, is uh, usually low. But what is important is that TB, you see, uh, takes a, a very important part. So uh, if we go a bit further, I took their, their part, chai part from, from uh, their studies, and I tried to look at the different... Uh, how it reflects. And you can see, okay, here we have dengue fever. This is the DALI of dengue fever. Here is uh, Japanese encephalitis. This goes here. If we have the uh, respiratory infections, then you have influenza. And then when you look at, uh, let's say, typhoid, paratyphoid, you have this bloodstream infection. But you can see that there is large components that are not taken uh, uh, into account. And that's why uh, we think that we, we need to include all the ones that, for example, have respiratory diseases, because if you miss TB, especially in adults, and in Africa where HIV is high, really you miss a lot of, of uh, the burden of disease. So the key messages of uh, <laughs> this talk when you see that, uh, I think it's not possible at this stage to have an overall picture of etiology of fever, if, if you agree, in different geographical locations, due to, to this considerable heterogeneity between the studies, how they have been implemented. The systematic reviews, I try to really to take the systematic review and to make a summary of all those, but I, it was a mess, because really you go from zero to 78%. This is absolutely uh, useless. And uh, so I think this is the range, yes, but that's it. And we know that the range can be, it can be even completely 90% uh, in an epidemic. So it's really very difficult to interpret. I, I look at, oh, this, there was a lot of leptospirosis, and actually it was a flood, uh, just after a flood. So, you know, y y it's, it's very difficult to do that. So case definition should include composite diagnostic criteria, clinical and laboratory. This is very important. The epidemics, we cannot do anything, but they render etiology of fever studies highly variable, if you, even if you do it very well. And to reflect the true burden of acute fever, all patients should be included. Now, just a few words, because that is the topic of the, of the meeting. The question was, febrile illness, a unified approach to protocol design for multicentered studies. My question is, do we really need other etiology studies after the fibrous study, <laughs> which is absolutely crucial because it's where we will get probably less heterogeneity and it's all the discussion that, that, that was at the start of this uh, project. So I think this, we will have a reasonable idea, even though that it will be at certain places at certain time, but that's it. That's much better than what we had probably in the past. But then once we will get that, what we will gain more doing other studies. And I think what is very important is to look at the disease predictors because we need to improve the pretest probabilities because that's the only way to improve our management of, of the cases. And probably Valerie will, will talk about that afterwards. But you, you may say, but to do predictors, you have to do fever studies. Yes, it's true. But you have to actually include everybody and do everything in all. So then you can, uh, not the laboratory test, but certainly if you want to go for symptoms and signs, which is very important because that's what we get in the limited resources that we work in, it's important. So this is what you get, for example, in, in, in the same study that we did in Tanzania, the predictors for typhoid fever. I just take an example here. You know that 
a likelihood ratio over five is basically you can include the, pa the, um, the diagnosis and less than zero two you can rule out the diagnosis and you can see that actually abdominal tenderness for typhoid fever is pretty good. So that's what you can include in your algorithm to go a bit further. Same for example we did for bacterial in infection. You can see chest in drawing, 19 the likelihood ratio so, I mean, Kazi knows that because <laughs> there was a lot of discussion on that for the children. But I think really it still uh, uh, can really help you taking a lot of different uh, uh, symptoms and signs to improve and including bi uh, biomarkers or whatever you want that you can uh, actually try to see what is the probability of a child to have uh, something. So that's what uh, in a recently published by uh, Bocho's group, it's the, he uses that for the, the important malaria, endemic fever, crop typhus, leptospirosis, dengue, and you see what you can rule out basically malaria if you have a rash and lymphadenopathy, et cetera. So you can work with that uh, to, to improve your, your, your uh, management. Now, obviously, probably sentinel site with ongoing syndromic surveillance and in that investigation, if you have something, a signal, that is probably the way to go for the future. And maybe what is interesting, I think this was done in the Gambia probably when David, you know, after, a bit after David, uh, the hemophilus influenza vaccine was done. But this was fantastic. You have an almost 100% effective vaccine. You see how many respiratory infections you have in the control group and in the intervention group, and you have 20% reduction. You know that probably hemophilus influenza is responsible for about 20% of these respiratory infections. And I think with these kind of studies, you can also infer what is the contribution of each pathogen. So I think it's good. Now the last thing, and you will see more on that, is the targeted intervention studies rather than doing only HLG. You do something more. You do an intervention. You look at what you get. For example, if you reduce the number of uh, children with antibiotics, you may say uh, this is really the, the percentage of children that need antibiotics, let's say 10% in an outpatient clinic. You may say some other have bacterial infection, but it is not the bacterial infection that do matter if your health outcome is as good as if you give antibiotics in 100%. So that's also the way uh, to go for the future. Because at the end, it's really what we want to do is to improve the health of children and adults rather than doing hundreds and hundreds of tests. Thank you very much. Uh, for this excellent uh, 